pleasure tonight to have Dr. Stanford Lindsay and his wife with us. And I'm going to ask him to come and take his liberty to share the message that God has laid upon his heart tonight for this congregation. Dr. Lindsay, would you come? God bless you. Amen. Thank you. And good evening, friends. Good evening. Let's say it better than that. Good evening, friends. Good evening. Good evening. That's a lot better. Sister Lindsay, stand up. Let the folks see who you are, honey. Give her a hand. Yeah. Yeah.
And being very conscientious people, we've always been taught to search our heart. Be sure everything's right with God. Nothing is always ever right with God. There's always something the matter with us. And this horrible introspection will kill you. Always looking inside to find out what's the matter. And keep digging it up. My friend, it's time to stop that. There's no end to what's the matter with you. <laughs> and you seem to realize that that's true. The greatest discouragement in the world is to keep looking into your own heart for there's no good thing there. But when you look to Jesus, the author, and the finisher of your faith, and keep your eyes on him, we go from grace to grace and glory to glory. Hallelujah! Shout out the hallelujah with me. Therefore, the victory is not looking down inside your heart. That doesn't help a thing. It keeps reminding you of what you are. And then somebody said, well, don't you have to be worthy? No, you don't have to be worthy. You're not anyway. We don't come to God because we're worthy. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Ha, 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 Why don't you hold up any standard? No. Just the grace of God that appeared to bring salvation to all mankind, that's all. And then walk in the light that you have. That's the way to victory. That's the way to what right kind of holiness is. Doing what you know to do. Hallelujah. And leaving everybody else alone. We're not going to be judgmental. What you do may not be any of my business. And that's the way it works. We've got to be free in the spirit if we're going to serve God acceptably. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I find that the more holy a person gets, and the more spiritually minded a person gets, the more he loves people. Amen. The more he loves God's people, the more he loves God. Now that's true holiness. Hallelujah. And then somebody said, well, yeah, but don't you have to clean up your act? That's been one of our problems. We wanted people to clean up their acts before they ever got to God. Honey, if you can clean up your act before you get to God, you don't need God. Amen. But you haven't made it. I was in Phoenix, Arizona some time ago. A young fellow came up to get the baptism. I'll tell you the story as I know it now. And he came up to get the baptism. The story was he brought up in a Pentecostal home. His father was a Baptist Bible teacher in the local church. Mother filled with the Spirit. And he wanted a baptism. Everybody said, you've got to clean up your act. He couldn't clean it up. Smoke, a few things. And he heard about the meeting. He thought he'd go to the assembly one more time. And I preached that night. And he said to himself, I'm going forward. What's love? I don't get it. This is it. I forget the whole thing. And he came down there. And I laid hands on him. He began to speak in tongues very little. I said, son, you haven't said I don't feel like it. I said, your feelings don't got anything to do with it. That's another one of our problems. We've always got to feel something. No, you don't. We don't we're not saved by feeling. We're saved by what the Word of God says. And if you're going to get anything from God, you get it on the basis of what God's Word says, not what you feel about. Oh, we've got to get back to the faith walks, our problem. I said to the young man, I said, look, don't, don't evaluate it tonight. Go home and practice your prayer language, tell me what happens. He came back the next night, I mean, radiant, all the glow. He got home and got, got in his bedroom by himself and let go, and I mean, the power of God came down and stirred his soul. Then God helped him clean up his act. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. I don't know why it is, but we hate the smoker, don't we? We don't like him. I've often wondered why do we hate him so badly. Is, are we jealous? Are they doing something we can't do? I don't know. And I've heard people say, God won't fill a smoker. Well, he certainly does. I've seen a lot of people who smoke up there with the Spirit. 
Somebody said to me one night, but can a smoker go to heaven? Well, of course he can if he's saved. And not only that, if he keeps on smoking, he's going to die and get to heaven before the rest of us. <laughs> so, smoker, if you're homesick for heaven, keep up and you're on the way. <laughs> sure, don't touch him. He's going home before we are. <laughs> All right, I've got to get another message here. But I have to say a few of these things. So people can get limbered up a little bit and begin to realize God has something for you. I don't care who you are. If you haven't done the baptism, you ought to desire it. And if you let some different things stand in your way, get out of that tonight. Don't wait to get your act cleaned up, you can't make it. Don't wait to get holy, you'll never make it. Don't wait to get victory, you'll never make it. You may have had a fight with a wife last week, or vice versa. You may have scrapped with a kid. Don't let that worry you. Come on to God and get what God's got for you. There's the point. Hallelujah. He'll help you clean up your act afterwards. And it'll take you the next 50 years to do that. It's not settled all at one time, you know. All right. Now, let me ask you, incidentally, I've been told I speak very abruptly, and I think I do. Of course, I've served in the United States Navy for 28 years. You can't live in the Navy that long and not be affected. <laughs> so, to be the best we can tonight and to accomplish what we can, I have to be friends to you and you have to be a friend to me, right? Amen. That's right. And so, if for some reason I should seem abrupt or crude or rude, you just say to yourself, well, he's been in the Navy so long he can't help. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, tonight we pray you bless the reading of your word. Open our hearts and minds, fill with thy spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to be very open and frank with you, as you already know. I want you to be open and frank with me. I'm going to give an invitation at the close of the service, so you can expect that. And God will fill any of you with the Holy Spirit. Let me ask the question tonight, and I want you to answer properly. How many of you have not yet received the baptism of the Spirit, but you are interested? Let me see your hands. Raise them high. Thank you. Raise them high all over. Raise them high. That's beautiful. Good. Don't be afraid. Nothing going to happen. Now, at the close of the service, I want you to respond immediately and promptly. We don't drag it on. And God will fill you just in that fashion. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel it coming on already. Some of you didn't raise your hand, you'll get a little more courage before it comes and you join it. <laughs> Let me start by saying that it appears that in the Old Testament period, God was a respecter of persons. That seems to be true because he did not give the Holy Spirit to everybody in the Old Testament days. Just the very important people, for example, for example the kings, the priests, the prophets, the judges and the various redeemers who came around from time to time, did God give of his spirit. And then even then, that was a spasmodic moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not come upon them to remain upon them or within them as we understand it today. And of course in those days, the common man was simply a follower in the camp. He did what he was told, period. He didn't do what you were told. They threw you out of the camp. And if he threw you out of the camp, you were lost. You had to belong to the tribes of Israel in those days to be saved. Now, the doctrine or the inception of the Holy Spirit baptism had its beginning probably around 830 years before the time of Jesus. The prophet Joel, under the anointing of predictive prophecy, made the statement, It shall come to pass afterward, that I will put out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days I will pour out of my spirit. What Joel is saying from his vantage point, the time is coming in which God will no longer be a respecter of people, but he will give the Holy Spirit to anybody and everybody who shall call upon the name of the Lord, and they shall be saved. Educated or ignorant, 
rich or poor, red and yellow, black and white, will make no difference. The man that calls, God will hear. I think it was in your own city some time ago, a very leading clergyman made the statement that he didn't think God would hear a Jew when he prayed. I take exception to that. God will hear any man when he prays. Oh, thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. We know he hears because he heard people like you and me. Well, now we must skip the 800 years rather rapidly and find ourselves in the New Testament in Matthew 3. And in verse 11, John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John Baptist has come on the scene preaching a baptism of repentance, a water baptism, if you please. John has come out of the Judean hills, hills, wearing a leather girdle about his waist and having eaten locusts and wild honey. He came after the order of an Old Testament prophet, and the Jews accepted him as such. They understood what John was doing and what John was saying. They understood so that they repented of their sins, were confessing their sins, and being baptized of John in Jordan. Now, this was not a new thing. The Jews have always had baptisms and washings. That's nothing new. They've always, their prophets have called them to repentance down through the years of their history. They understood this. That's why they went to John. Now, but John said, one new element did come in here. John says, while I baptize with water, he, that is Christ, will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, that was something new. Never before had it been said that there was a spirit baptism. Now we have a spirit baptism, and Jesus Christ is he who shall baptize with the Holy Spirit. Someone has said, Jesus can more aptly be called the Baptist than he can the Savior, because there's more said about his baptizing work than there is about his saving work. And that's true. Now when John made his statement about the baptism, all of a sudden you have two baptisms on your hand, water and spirit. Man baptizes another in the element of water. Jesus Christ baptizes the person in the element of the Holy Spirit. We understand that. There is yet one more baptism we must be familiar with, found in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and that is the baptism into the body of Christ. And it reads like this. For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be bound or free, and then also made to drink into one Spirit. Now, in this text, it is the Holy Spirit who is the baptizer. It is his business to deal with the sinner, bring him to a knowledge of sin, bring him to a knowledge of a need of repentance, bring him to Jesus Christ, give him the ability to believe and make a profession of faith, and when he does, the Holy Spirit puts places, sets, or baptizes the person into the body of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the term baptize here, then, is used in a metaphorical sense, meaning to place in or put in or set in, you see, into the body of Christ. Now, all Christians have been baptized into the body of Christ because that's been the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You are a member of the body. If you haven't been baptized into the body of Christ, you're not even saved. It's that simple. For well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. In the last part of that phrase in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, in the New International Version, the reading is better. It says we were all given the one spirit to drink. That's a little more clear, isn't it? In other words, when we came to Jesus, we took a drink of the Holy Spirit. We took a sip, if you please. We became partakers. Then, that being true, it must be said that all Christians have the Holy Spirit. Wave at me, you alive out there? Now, I don't know why this, some of our people don't seem to understand this. It's true whether you believe it or not. Paul said in Romans 8 9, if a man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God. They are one of the same, you know. Hallelujah. Paul said in 1 
Corinthians 6, 19, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. And my friends, all evangelicals are reading these same scriptures and believe them. Your Nazarenes and your holy people, they all read this. They all believe this. The Baptists read this. They believe this. They know this. Let me tell you something, friends. We are in the Pentecostal churches. We're not the only people God has. If we are, he's pretty hard enough. Got there? All right. Sure. Hallelujah. So when we came to Jesus, we partook of the Holy Spirit. Now, I emphasize this because, you know, we've had people come in many, many churches. People come forward to get the baptism. They don't know what's about to happen. And they heard all kinds of wild stories of what God did to people. So they'll come with fear and trembling. What's God going to do to me? <laughs> They're afraid God's going to do something. I was trying to help a young fellow get the baptism one night. He couldn't seem to get the idea. All of a sudden he understood. He opened his mouth and began to speak in tongues. Afterwards he said to me, you know what? No, you never know until a person tells you. I said, what? He said, I thought the Lord was supposed to zap me. <laughs> He's not going to zap you. In fact, I don't think the word is in the concordance. I stress this because if you know that you already have the Holy Spirit, you are not to expect an alien, absentee spirit to come down from God out of heaven into you. No way, Jose. It doesn't work that way. But for some reason we've got these kind of ideas. Rather the Holy Spirit who is already within you will enable you to manifest His presence in the speaking in tongues. Now, isn't that more easy? Isn't that more beautiful? Of course it is. A word about the fire in Matthew 3.11. I've heard marvelous sermons on the fire in Matthew 3.11. I haven't believed many of them, but I've heard them. I don't know much about that. But I will tell you what the text says. He is not going to baptize you with two things. He's going to baptize you with one thing. And the text probably understood says this. What you have here, if I have school teachers here, you'll understand this. We have a, a uh, construction in the text, a grammatical construction we call a endiatus. All that means is you have two nouns, spirit and fire, joined with a conjunction and spirit and fire. Now, the way that should be interpreted is the word fire should be used as an adjective to explain or describe or modify the first noun spirit. In other words, the text should read, He will baptize you with the fiery Holy Spirit. Glory to God. Now, son, if you get it, He'll be a fire in your bones to help you do what you need to do and get everything going right. Hallelujah. Now, let's move on. Following Jesus, John came on the scene, or following John, Jesus came on the scene and had his ministry for, for some three years. He's been preaching, he's been healing, he's been comforting. The time he's come, he's going to go away and he's begun to make it known. However, he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now, this is a paradoxical statement. I'm going to go away, but I'm never going to leave you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, let's back up here. How do you understand this? We have it given in John 14 at verse uh, 16. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. Hallelujah. When he says he will send another, this implies equality. Someone who can do what Jesus did. Same capability. Only now he will not be limited. And he said in John 16, 7, It is expedient for you. It is necessary. It is advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Spirit will not come. Now, we have something here. And the rationale simply is this. Jesus in the flesh was limited to the time-space concept. He could only be at one place at one given time. That's all. 
If that were true tonight, if he were here, no other Christian would have him. If he was somewhere else, he would not be with us. Limited to the body, if you please. But when he would go away and return in the person and power of the Holy Spirit, he could be with all of God's people simultaneously around the world. And it can be said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Hallelujah! How do we sense his presence tonight? Oh, give him a clap. And we hate to see somebody go sliding in easy, don't we? 
It's a gift, honey. You can't earn it. All you can do is learn how to take it. Amen. And that's all I'm going to show you is how to take it. Somebody says, well, the Lord knows what's in my heart. That's right, he does. But it's not coming out unless you open your mouth and let it out. Amen. Amen. Oh, that's where it's at. Now, if we can learn a few principles, we'll help ourselves. Well, let's move on. I've been in one of our churches, and I preached. In fact, I preached rather lately. In fact, I was tired today. I preached for an hour and 15 minutes. I had made the statement, I don't believe in tiring to receive the baptism of the Spirit. The pastor asked me to go to the door and greet people as he came out, and I did. And a middle-aged lady came out of the door, and she was mean. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she was mad. I had upset her. She said, how come you don't believe in tarrying? I had preached. I don't know where she was. She must have taken a nap when I hit that one. Now she wants some private instructions. I was trying to get out of there and go home. I was mad. I didn't want to sit around. I said, well, I don't believe it's in the Bible. She said, you read it. I said, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. I said, where? She said, Luke 24. Well, let's take a look at Luke 24. Verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, by they blessed him, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continuing to the temple, praising and blessing God. Nowhere did I see it say tarry. Did you? Never said. I'll tell you what it did say, and if you believe the Bible from cover to cover, word for word, you would have to do this. It does say tarry in Jerusalem. It does not say tarry in Atlanta. That's what it says. So if you're going to tarry, get a Holy Land trip, you've got to go to Jerusalem. Cost you 2,000 bucks. But somehow, if we didn't even know the Bible, we would know better than that, wouldn't we? If you didn't even know the Bible, you'd know better than that. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Listen, let me say something. We have no right to take a word out of the Bible and make it say what we want it to say. Amen. No way you can't do that. That's a private interpretation when you do that. When you take any phrase or words out of the scripture, take it out of context, it ceases to be the word of God at that point. It's only the word of God in context. You had it right. Say it louder back there. It's only the word of God in context. That's all. But we've done those kind of things. And so we take one. In fact, I picked up one of our current articles here a few months, a few weeks ago. Somebody wrote a prize article. And on the front of the paper had the word carry until dot 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 close the quotation. Carry until what? That's not even a complete statement. At least when Jesus told them to tarry, there was a time element and a closure on it. They only had to wait 10 days. We've known it over for 30 years and that people haven't done it yet. You out there? You better believe. You know, the Lord gave me a special revelation on this one day. Now, I don't get special revelations very often. <laughs> I generally have to read and study for everything I get. So when the Lord gives me a shortcut, I appreciate it. And so I was thinking on this one day, I'm going to tell you really what happened down in Jerusalem that day. Now I'm going to talk in street language so it'll be easy to understand. Now here's what happened. Remember, remember, they were in Jerusalem. They didn't have a public. They were already there. Now what happened was simply this. Jesus was talking to them about waiting for the promise of the Father. Then what he said was, by the way, boys, don't leave town till you get it. That's all he said. We make a big thing. Harry until. All he said was, don't leave town until you get it. And they said, okay, Jesus, we'll hang around. 
And they did. <laughs> now we have some funny things come up here. Some people think of the upper room. I don't. It says they were in the temple. That's what I believe. That's what the word says. I've been in the upper room and they won't take 120 people anyway. But they were in the temple. Some people think they were in the temple, I mean, praying 24 hours a day for 10 days. Oh, no, they weren't. Nobody prays that much, not even you people. <laughs> and the scripture properly understood does not say that. It says continue in the temple. If it had meant 24 hours a day for 10 days, it would have said continuously. It didn't say that. It said continually, which simply means they were in the temple. Every time the temple doors opened for service, they were there. That's what it means. Didn't mean they lived down there. If you were in your church every time the doors opened for service, and you ought to be, it can be said you're continually in church. It doesn't mean you live down here, though your friends may think you do. <laughs> Hallelujah. And no great introspection. Remember, friends, Pentecost was a harvest festival. They were eating and drinking, having a grand time, worshiping and celebrating. I'm going to tell you, we need to learn how to celebrate. Amen. If we learn how to celebrate, we'd have the glory of God coming down in the camp. We'd rejoice. We'd share the glory. We'd eat and drink to the glory of God. We'd have a wonderful time. And we'd have souls saved by the score. Who shall see? Who wants to go to a morbid Pentecostal prayer meeting? I see some of you down here. Don't you know what I'm talking about? Don't misunderstand me. There's a time for a sacred prayer meeting where you wrestle with God. I'm not debating that part. That's not the point. There's a time you get before God and pray and cry and pray. I understand that. I'm talking about our corporate prayer meetings. There ought to be a time we come and worship. Oh, lift our hearts. Lift your hands right now. Begin to worship. Hallelujah. Now walk out to it. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Holy 
Spirit movement comes from within the person. Oral Roberts has made a statement that I like. He made a statement, there's a prayer language stored up in our spirit, just as there's a natural language stored up in our mind. You and I can get together, we don't have to stop and think, now what am I going to say? We just open our mouth and talk what comes out, and if you listen to people, you can tell them that's true. <laughs> we just talk what comes out. Now, when God put man and woman in the garden, we understand he put him there in a perfect condition. Everything was right, no sin. He had proper and good communication with God. He could talk with God any way he wanted to. He could get through to God. God says, the day you sin, that day you'll die. And the day he sinned, that day he died. Communication with God was broken. No longer could he talk with God. He didn't want to talk to God. He began to hide out from God. There is no communication. But when God begins to deal with a man and sends the Holy Spirit after a man and gets a hold of his heart and comes into his heart and a man is born again, all of a sudden his soul becomes alive. He's open to the things of God. His spirit is alive. That language comes alive in his spirit. Now he can talk to God in a spiritual realm. Who she comes. It would seem to me that every person who's been born again would want to have communication with his father. Amen. They were it. it was the intellectual can't take care of it. It's limited. How often have you talked to somebody, you're trying to be right, you've said the wrong thing. Then it takes another 30 minutes to try to square up what you said wrong. We're limited by our intelligence. Some of us don't have too much to work with. But you can pray in the Spirit, and there's no mistake there. <laughs> because the mind can't louse it up. Thank God there's one place the mind can't louse it up. We've loused up about everything else we've touched. But pray in the Spirit, pray in the divine secret. Hallelujah. That happens when a man gets saved or a woman gets saved. <clears throat> Peter said in the great Pentecostal summer, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in chapter 7 of John, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, from within him, these are all synonymous terms, from his heart shall go rivers of living water. But this spoke be of the Spirit. Where did he say it was coming from? Not from heaven. From his heart. It's right here. And we're still telling people to look it up. I don't know what for. It's coming from here. So close we haven't realized it. No wonder we can't seem to touch it yet. All right. Now, I was, some years ago, I spoke, and I was invited to speak in the Pentagon. I was a Navy chaplain. And I was, and then, I went to speak in the Pentagon and spoke on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They asked me to. One of my publishers says, the, Pente the Pentagon needs Pentecost. <laughs> and I wrote a book called Pentecost in the Pentagon. I preached it. That morning I gave an invitation, quite a number came forward and received a mighty baptism right there in the country. Miles, miles. One was a Baptist Marine Major. In full uniform, metal to metal. Highly decorated. I didn't have to say highly decorated. Any Marine that's alive is highly decorated. The dead ones are the only ones who don't have decoration. The rest of them live. He's a Baptist. What a fireball. He's still in the Marine Corps. He's now a full colonel in the Marine Corps, a fighter pilot. Some years ago, he was in Japan with the 3rd Marine Airway. Merle Allender. Any of you full gospel businessmen would know that name, probably. Merle Allender. He was speaking for the full gospel fellowship in Tokyo in January of a year. 
In April of that same year, I received a letter from Tokyo from a Mr. Yoshimura, who is a member of the board of Sanyo Chemical Industries, Tokyo. Oh, how like beautiful letter. Dear Dr. Lindsay, I heard Colonel Merlander speak. He said you laid hands on him when he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He says my wife and I are coming to Anaheim, California to attend the World Convention Full Gospel Fellowship in July of that year. Would you do me the honor? Meet with me in my motel room and pray that I might receive the baptism of the Spirit. I wrote back and acknowledged that I would. July came, Mrs. Lindsay and I made our way to Anaheim. Found the motel where the little man was supposed to be. Found the, the room he was in, knocked on the door. And the little man and his wife greeted us. A lovely, elderly couple. About this tall, small people. Lovely, courteous people. They invited us in. Now the little lady was spirit-filled, but spoke no English. And the man spoke a broken English, so I had to listen carefully. And he told me the story. We laid hands on him, and he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in his hotel. hotel. We were going to leave, but he wanted to take us to lunch, so we went out across the parking lot to a small restaurant, had a bite to eat. Coming back, we were going to get in our car and go home. He, was, he and his wife were going back to the motel room. For some reason, we stopped in the middle of the parking lot and threw our hand up and began to shout the glory and talk in tongues. I had to say that if the world can spit and smoke and chew and cuss in the parking lot, I can shout the glory and talk in tongues. Thank you. 
He had been seeking 70 years. You can say he's patient, couldn't you? <laughs> Will you please come forward? Sunday evening worship service broadcasting live from Riverdale Assembly of God, 6449 Church Street in King Road.